Hello and welcome to Optimize Coach, Coaching with Luminaries. Absolutely thrilled to be welcoming our Luminary guest faculty members today, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz and Josie Thompson. Um, they are absolutely amazing. Dr. Schwartz is a research psych psychiatrist with an expertise in applied mindfulness. Five books, uh, The Brain Lock, Dear Patrick, The Mind and the Brain, and You Are Not Your Brain, along together with Josie and Art Kleiner, the um, wise advocate, subtitle there, The Inner Voice of Strategic Leadership. Absolutely love this book, the intersection of so many different things. Um, Josie is an internationally certified master coach, three times coach of the year, significant senior leadership experience, both herself and her clients. Um, absolutely phenomenal story, have overcome a lot in your personal life. Just a demonstration of resilience and you guys have not just written this book, but also created a platform of master classes for um, the, the brain, right? That's right. So I'm just so looking forward to this. We are all about mindfulness here. I wrote down Dr. Schwartz has been meditating daily since 1975, an insight type of practice. Josie, since 2010, both daily. We require our coaches if they want to earn a certification to meditate on a daily basis, okay. Okay. 11 minutes minimum. So I wow. love the meditation practice, love applying this third person perspective to what we're seeing, what we're doing um, on an individual basis, on a leadership basis, et cetera. So we're gonna have so much fun today. I'm so looking forward to unpacking a little bit more of your wisdom as it applies to individuals, coaches, leadership, et cetera. So welcome. Hi. It's great to be here. Yeah. So I'd love to start off just with the idea of a wise advocate from the get-go. What is that? Why is it important? How do we know where they are and, and how to communicate with them, et cetera? Okay, so um, I guess I'll give a little history because, you know, actually we kind of coined that term and so there's a history to, to it. And I think the history kind of explains, explains it because um, it, um, there's a, um, a variety of reasons why we, we came to the wise advocate term. Um, so that term is, is the core central concept of, of the book, You Are Not Your Brain. And, uh, th and that was written with uh, uh, another uh, psychiatrist actually named Rebecca Gladding. And, um, and that was when she was actually still um, a resident in psychiatry at UCLA. And I had known her for quite a few years before that, because of her interest in obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, I, I had uh, for a long time to, in, in order to have uh, what was kind of a user-friendly Western um, conception of what mindfulness is. And by mindfulness, uh, which I do have a very long history, as you said, going back to 1975 and, and um, you know, and, and have studied the, you know, ancient scripture out of which mindfulness came, which is a, a Theravada Buddhist uh, scripture written in, in the language Pali, which is a dialect of Sanskrit. And I studied that language and, you know, et cetera. And so, but we didn't, you know, we didn't want to present it that way. And we, and we really don't present it hardly that way very much. I mean, I'm, I'm mentioning that here because I have a sense that you know, that it's user friendly based on what, what you just said. I mean, in, we, we recognize that in a lot of our, our audiences, it's not so user friendly. So then I, so then I don't use, you even reveal that information, but, but um, a Western um, way of thinking about that came from Adam Smith, the, you know, the great, you know, the founder of free enterprise economics, the author of, of the book, uh, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And, but he wrote another book called um, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And that was his actually most important book for him. And he revised it many times during his life. And in fact, it was the last thing he ever did was prepare the sixth edition, much mm -hmm. revised. And, that, and, and he died shortly after that. And, and in that sixth edition, he really expanded what's called the impartial spectator concept. Um, in that book. And impartial spectator, you know, has a lot in common with mindfulness because it, it's this whole notion of observing, of having a, 
an impartial observer and a, what I sometimes like to call an outer or a third person perspective, a clear minded observational perspective on on your inner on your experience, all your feelings, thoughts, you know, interpretations, perspectives, etc. Um, so we were all we re, we were I've been using that concept and really liked it as a linking concept and between, you know, sort of East and West, you know, and, and it's Adam Smith, you know, you kind of can't get more Western than that. And, and, and there it is. I mean, it shows that there's nothing sort of woo woo about, about that, about that concept particularly or necessarily. So, so, um, but we also recognize that impartial spectator is not so user-friendly. I mean, it's not the most user-friendly kind of a term and, and, and in fact, very near the end of finishing um, You Are Not Your Brain, um, Rebecca Gladding's mother, who she was very kind of close with and was running things by, and we, you know, we always said if we had another term, we would strongly consider it. And she suggested this term, the wise advocate. Um, and, and, uh, and I immediately liked that term because, because that actually, that term mm -hmm. does have some Judeo- Christian, a, a biblical um, context to it, and which one could easily elaborate on. So I immediately said, okay, that's a good connector. And, and, um, and, and so we went with it. And in fact, at the very end of before, just before um, uh, submitting the manuscript, we actually changed impartial spectator to wise advocate, and then we kind of smoothed it out. And, that, you know, and that's how, how the book came out. And so why, what's the improvement? I mean, the improvement is that you can readily say about wise advocate that it's an inner loving guide. I mean, uh, I mean, it, contain, it, it, it contains a notion of caring about you that the impartial spectator concept doesn't does not contain in in nearly the same way. Um, and then the other point that's very true, again, to, to the, you know, again, to to the the older sort of um specifically christian application of this term advocate um is is that you can have an inner narrative with it i mean you can talk to it you can actually have a narrative and and so and so we we really could construct it as a concept that everyone can access and it could be you know it could be much more sort of down to earth if you want and that works and that's where the, the adam smith stuff is helpful it's an observer but, but it's an observer that you can have an inner dialogue with. And so the whole notion of creating a narrative um, and, and, and having an inner guide, an inner loving guide that you could, you know, w work things through towards. And then, and then the, the other, only other concept that you really need to really kind of bring it to sort of the big picture for, is, is you're working, striving towards creating a true self a true self, which is your, you know, the goals and values that you really believe in and want to stand for. But we always do like to say that, you know, but that's always a work in process and you never actually achieve your true self, but you're always striving for that. And so you're striving for it in conjunction with creating a narrative with your wise advocate. And then, you know, with, with Josie, that started to really work, um, you know, in, co in a coaching context and, and out of that grew, grew the book, The Wise Advocate. But, but the you are not your brain concept is, is really user friendly for coaches, especially the way, the way Josie, you know, contextualizes it. Mm -hmm. And Josie, when you, you, you came across it, it immediately resonated with you or resonated quickly enough that you thought there's an application for this in the coaching world, in the leadership world. What about it kind of drew you to it? And then if you could pick it up from there. Okay, well, for me, uh, people are probably aware that I'm a two times cancer survivor. And the first time was in 1991, and I was 24 years old, and I was given six months to live. And at that time, everything that I had believed and was taught to me about the way the world works and about this concept of God and was just irrelevant because the, my constructs didn't make sense anymore. And so everything was up for negotiation. I threw up every question. But this time, instead of seeking the answers out there, 
I was inquiring within myself to seek what the, the truth was, what was the truth. So that was probably the beginning. And then in 2010, when I had the brain situation, my own, I was in the middle of neuroscience studies. And I had met Jeff at the very first Neuro Leadership Summit in Asolo in 2006 or eight. Jeff, do you remember? Yeah. I think it might have been four even. I forget, actually. Four or five. It was six. 2006, yeah. Okay. And we had this immediate you know, connection because I, I, I had this introduction to neuroscience through the Neuro Leadership Institute. And straight away, there was something that just went, I'm curious. There's something here I need to learn about. And it set me on this path to understand how this thing works, where our beliefs and thoughts come from, how do you make sense of all of that and how do you navigate life when things from left field come in and all of a sudden everything gets challenged and you really have to dig deep to understand, well, what is the truth? What is my path? How do I show up in the best way possible for the long run? And this is where the concept of the wise advocate made complete sense to me. Because we all have, well, most people have some kind of belief system in whether it's the universe, in, in God, source, whatever it is to you. And it's like that inner dialogue that you have, you know, when you're praying, when you're asking for guidance, is a way of describing what the wise advocate is and being able to connect with that source and align yourself in such a way that even though there is a lot of uncertainty to navigate, you know you're on the right path. There is this inner sense of peace and guidance that allows you to take one brave, bold, but sure step forward into what may feel like the unknown and know that you're okay and know that it's the right thing to do in the long run. Because oftentimes what people do, and Jeff might elaborate on this, is when we're faced with a challenge or an important decision to make, they go for expedience rather than the right thing to do in the long run. Because it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but you know in your heart, your soul, your whole energy that it is the right thing to do. And the wise advocate is that inner loving guide that assures you of that step. I love, so that resonates so deeply. And yet the, the, the question I have is, okay, well then how do we actually do that? Cause it's, it's one thing to know, okay, I've got a voice inside that's got me to, to do different things and I'm going to take a step here, but part of entering the unknown, embracing doubt, uncertainty that I know you guys speak a lot about, but part of that almost includes not being absolutely certain that it's the right next step and not having this this full degree of trust is like, really wise advocate? Like, are you, are you sure that's, that's the right move? So how do we actually do that? Yeah. So, I mean, okay. I mean, and, and, and I, I partly actually gave sort of the lead into that perspective when I said, you never, you know, you never actually really do get to your true self. I mean, so, so it, I mean, it, it, it always is a work in progress and you're all, and you're always, um, sort of reevaluating and, 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 and then, okay. So now we get into, I honestly didn't know that you, you know, you stress meditation the way you said you did. Um, so that, I mean, so, and then we also have a lot of voices in, in, you know, and, and they're not all wise and that's a hugely important thing. Um, I mean, hugely, hugely important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, and that could lead in very philosophical, theological directions, which I'm not going to go. But I mean, nothing, nothing in my entire belief system at all ever would say that all the voices you hear in your head are good. They're not. I mean, and so I really stress that they're not. And, and so another major concept of, of the book, You Are Not Your Brain, is decept deceptive brain messages. And, and, and that's where, you know, that's where sort of the more of some of the clinical psychology comes in, but, but it, it's also highly relevant to, you know, things that are just not psychotherapy, but just, you know, really proper understanding of mindfulness. And, um, you know, to put it in, 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 again, a classical mindfulness perspective, um, I mean, 
you, you know, the function of mindfulness. I mean, why mindful? Why be mindful? I mean, there's lot, lots of reasons, but, but one of the most straightforward ones in the ancient texts is, is, is to make discernments between what, what are called wholesome mm-hmm. and unwholesome or skillful and unskillful mental states. I mean, so, so the notion of, of um, I mean, if you hadn't mentioned that, you know, meditation is a necessity, I wouldn't like to be saying this quite so assertively as this, because, you know, when we speak to people who aren't, you know, committed to doing meditation, I don't want to be like that assertive about it. But in fact, without doing some kind of structured practice, um, it becomes much, much harder to know what's the wise advocate and what's the deceptive mm-hmm. brain message. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and, um, and so breath awareness exercise, a basic a basic breath awareness exercise um, for focus. And, and, you know, and, and I, I'm quite aware that, you know, especially one of the, I mean, and just to bring in something about neuroscience, I mean, because I mean, you know, there is, I mean, if you say you are not your brain and you don't know very much about the brain, it's kind of an empty statement. But I mean, on the other hand, when you say you are not your brain and you know a lot about the brain, you become controversial with neuroscientists, which I am. So, so I mean, so it's it, it's a narrow balance um, to it's a narrow line to walk in 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 some ways. In, but but um, in neuroscience, one of the great advances of brain research um, using brain imaging of, of the last twenty years has in fact been this, the study of mindfulness with 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 neuro with brain imaging. And there's been a lot lot of work in that, and it's it's actually been very useful. And so. There are two kinds of basic categories that these sort of Western scholars have have um, sort of used terms, and one is called focused attention meditation, and then open awareness. And they're they're both important, um, but I do like to stress that when when you're experienced, you really do realize that without a fair amount of skill developed in the focused attention category, you're not going to be very good at open awareness because because the whole issue of open awareness is your mind wanders and i want i one of my favorite not favorite but one of the most common things i say is you know one of the first things you learn when you try to do the breath awareness exercise is that you know your mind your brain doesn't particularly want to be focusing on your breath and 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 so you're training you're training your mind not to wander it's a tension training and 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 so so once you have this focused attention training that you're, you're working on doing using breath awareness, which is, you know, really the, the thousands of year old, you know, way of doing it, um, it immediately brings up room for, for saying, OK, like, how am I going to sort of keep my mind focused and the wise advocate concept? And that's where we link it into mindfulness so clearly because you know, to be really candid about um, a strong uh, motivation that we had for coming up with another term, because I'd always used mindfulness. I'm, you know, I'm still comfortable with the term, but pop mindfulness has become significantly problematical be- because they, it, it has all of these, you know, non-judgmental used in very unsophisticated ways. I mean, um, and, and that's why in our conception, we, we talk, talk about the wise advocate and mindfulness being a bridge between the non-judgmental perspective that is open that you have to like be aware of all the thoughts and feelings and responses that come in and in that awareness you need a wise advocate to 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 actually make discernments So, so the two very important words are assessments and discernments and and that and that gets back to a basic understanding of of what real mindfulness is which is making assessments and discernments about the content uh, and 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 the skillful or unskillful wholesome or unwholesome nature of what your open non-judgmental perspective is bringing into you so non-judgmental is not an end in itself at all nor is being in the present moment an end in itself at all and to view it as such is really a, a, a um, it gets problematical. And so I think as, as this, you know, popularization of mindfulness is now, it's kind, it seems to be getting somewhat back onto the, a better track 
with that. I mean, for a while, it was like, be in the present moment, be non-judgmental, and then you're, no, that is just incorrect. I mean, um, and, and I mean, yes, you have to be in the present moment, and yes, you have to be non-judgmental to let the stuff come in, but then you have to use assessment and discernment mm -hmm. and, 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 and make assessments and discernments about the wholesome, unwholesome, skillful, unskillful nature of, of, uh, you know, of what you're observing. And that's intrinsic to where mindfulness is coming from in its original form description. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that, that issue of making assessments and discernments is built into a proper understanding of what's called right mindfulness. I mean, and, and um, so, so, you know, so, so when you add in wise advocate, you know, and then the realization of how much we get deceptive brain messages and then, and then, you know, if you wanted to sort of, which, you know, we don't have to do now, I mean, describe like what aspects of brain mechanisms, you know, emotional brain, executive brain. I mean, it, there are ways to talk about all of this and okay. I mean, it depends on where one wants to concentrate one's time, but you can understand, you get to understand because, because one of the things that all this research on, on, um, mindfulness has shown is that the connectivity between this frontal cortex the so-called executive brain that actually is very you need the executive brain to keep the attention focused to be goal oriented i mean and and so the whole issue of of, of being goal oriented and focusing your attention in goal oriented ways has a, has a lot to do with what the wise advocate is about and then that those exercises, the breath awareness exercise, mindfulness, you know, enhances connectivity between executive brain and, and emotional brain. So, and that helps with what's called self-regulation and self-management. So, so you can see how this, you know, the concept, you know, kind of grows and it's, it's not, it's not, it, it's, uh, it's not hard to understand, but it's not simplistic either. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so we're bringing in a lot of, of content around the issue of making assessments and discernments in consultation with your inner loving guide about the experiences you're becoming aware of because of this, you know, present moment, non-judgmental perspective. On that open, on that open awareness, you need to have, you know, a, a, a good capacity to focus your attention and connection with your wise advocate um, or to not get trapped into deceptive brain messages that will really mislead you and not in very, you know, maladaptive, non-productive ways. I, I love it. And, and for your, um, I love all the advances in neuroscience. I actually, the muse had been like monitors your brain waves and provides biofeedback. I went nuts on that. Oh, wow. It's really dark right now. I, like a thousand days in a row of this like brain monitoring piece to build that awareness perspective and return the focus. But I love this assess what's going on. So step one is to be able to be conscious of open awareness, what's going on period that we have thoughts that we've had different voices, and then to be able to discern which one's the wise advocate and I, I, you, you say it's trusting, right? We, we, we trust it. There's compassion for it. It's also um, dispassionate. So it's not attached to certain outcomes or whatever, but what's the best thing that we can do going forward in pursuit of some certain goals while we train our mind to be able to be conscious and then make that, that discernment, make that decision. It, it makes me think too about the, the whole free will, not free will debate. And it's almost like, well, it's both. We, we don't have free will of what's going on, period. And yet in that instant, in that moment, can we exercise our ability to discern what we want to do going forward and demonstrate our will um, going forward? How do you, um, I'm actually curious to hear more, and, and Joe, your perspective as well around when you're assessing the different voices and, and making a discernment on which one's the wise advocate, which one might be a different kind of voice, what do you look for? Is there other physiological things that, that you um, feel into versus think into? How do, you, how do you parse apart these different voices? Okay, well, I might answer this one first, Jeff. Uh, for me, it, your thoughts will either have uh, an effect of expansion or contraction. And that's probably the easiest way that, that helps me. It's like when, 
when the voice expands, it, you know that's the right thing to do. When the voice contracts, it's like, okay, that's not the right thing to do. And it's a very subtle cue. But the body knows, like the mind will tell up, tell you many, many stories. And as Jeff mentioned, you know, these deceptive messages about black and white thinking, all or nothing, that sort of thing, they come in. And the idea is to observe that they come in. And when you talked before, Michael, about free will, we have this thing called free won't. So the wise advocate will be able to say that's a deceptive message and you can feel it, you know, that that black and white thinking feels very limiting. And we talk about, you know, when we talk about emotion, the difference between love and fear, when it's, when it's coming from fear, that contraction's there. When it's coming from love and it's the right thing to do, the expansion is there. So it's very subtle. But you, if you tune into your body, you will actually be able to assess and discern that message but if all you're tuning into it, all the voices going on in your mind it can get incredibly confusing and so this is why it's important to have that capacity to be aware to observe in a dispassionate way and then to tune into that trusting inner loving guide that will say this is the right thing to do and you just know it because there's this sense of calmness and a sense of ease even though it's, it might be hard you know it might take a, a brave step to say or articulate or to do what you know you need to do but you know it's the right thing to do something in your body will resonate at a very deep level um, this deep inner knowing Jeff would you add to that yeah so I mean and if you want to just add some cognitive content on that mm. I mean because obviously yeah I mean having feelings so True. So this is where, you know, the true self, I mean, it's, mm. it, you know, it's a, it's a big complex, you know, sense. And especially when, and I can't say it too many times, you got to remember, you know, it, you are not going to actually be true self. I mean, you, you know, you're going it, to, it, you're always a work in progress and, and your concept of what, um, what you're striving for evolves changes you, you know at, you know as you learn you, you know and that's why in the four steps the fourth one is called revalue it's relabel reframe we're going to get to this later but relabel reframe refocus revalue and as your brain changes with self-directed neuroplasticity you know your values you know evolve and and your and your awareness of what you consider you know making being a true self is but one of the ways to sort of even in in because yes i mean there's the term cognitive distortions and that and and yes we are definitely integrated um with traditional cognitive therapy approaches and we're very like user friendly with what's called mindfulness based cognitive therapy i mean and i'm you know actually quite friendly with the people who developed that you know uh, john teasdale especially who really did develop that and and um so the thing is i mean you know, when you're relabeling, because I mean, just again, at the beginning to get into it, I mean, you know, you're kind of saying, oh, I feel this, I think this, I mean, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm disgusted, I'm, I'm you know, I'm content, I'm discontent, I'm, I'm on goal, I'm off goal. I'm, I mean, so just putting labels on it orients you and is a, a significant part of being mindful. And I just took that right out of the classic mindfulness practice of making mental notes. Um, which is a very big part of, of, of Vipassana, which means insight um, med meditation practice. Okay, um, so, so once you're becoming aware and now you're, you're re, and then when you're, we're talking about re, reframing and reframing is like really making an assessment. Is this true? Is this false? Thinking about it, thinking it through, it's not, always so obvious and and that really does bring in the con consultation with the wise advocate and one of the mm -hmm. things that Josie and I are very you know good it becomes a good habit to remember to say in consultation with the wise advocate I mean you're not mm -hmm. out there like you know it's not just your brain you are not your brain I mean you need you need a wise advocate concept to help to you know steer your brain so that you can you know, and anything you do repetitively will wire in those, those mm -hmm. circuits and that's self-directed neuroplasticity. So you're creating a brain that goes along with, is more conducive to this true self concept. So, 
so a significant a, a part of it is this cognitive element of relabeling and reframing and then deciding what's a good thing to focus on. And that's why the breath awareness exercise for directed attention and strengthening the executive brain's capacity to direct your attention, then you can refocus on the things that, that you think are adaptive. That, and, and, then, and, then, and then you're constantly re relabeling, reframing, and making more assessments because you're always making assessments and discernments. That's a constant, never-ending process. Constant, never-ending process. Just like our finding and becoming our true self is also That's a it. constant, never-ending process. They're you start speaking related. about the, the four steps of strategic leadership that you distill in the book. I know that's a tool you're going to introduce to us. Let's go ahead and transition then, do some coaching tools. So, you know, community of coaches here, not necessarily all aspiring to be one-on-one uh, -on -one coaches or group coaches or executive coaches, et cetera, but some people just using these skills in their own life or for their families or in a leadership context, et cetera. I know you've got some tools for us that we can use to coach ourselves and others, the four steps being one of them. And Josie, I think you've got one um, actually that might be a good transition into the four steps ahead of time. So I'd love yeah. to hear more about this tool. Okay, well, I'll start with a little model of the brain. Jeff loves this. <laughs> so the actual brain that we have is not much bigger than our fears. It's actually not very big at all. But if we were to dissect it, you'll see all these different components of the brain which have specific functions. And the two that we mainly talk about is the middle part of the brain, the emotional brain, the limbic system, and then the front part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, so the executive brain. So when you are directing your focus forward in a goal-oriented way, like Dr. Schwartz mentioned before, you're actually employing that prefrontal cortex. So when you feel like the driver, the leader of your life, you're in here making assessments and discernments about how to apply your focus and attention. What you're up against are the emotional sensations which arise through the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is the emotional center of the brain. And this is where we get in all of our sensory information. And the messages that come from in here are going to be quite strong and they become unconscious and habituated. So this is where all of our habit center is wired into. And that's what you're up against when you're trying to navigate your life in a very conscious way, because you have all these automatic habituated patterns of thoughts and behaviors that have been wired in over time that have now become automatic. So they, they, happen without your conscious awareness if you're not paying attention and that's why mindfulness is incredibly important when you're seeking to navigate your life in a more conscious and responsible way and so what we're not saying is that this is the enemy we're not saying that at all we we say use that to inform your process of assessment and discernment and ultimate decision making process and you do that in consultation with this construct that we call the wise advocate and that wise advocate is the place you go to to consult and have this inner narrative you know that you construct that's adaptive to the challenges that you're needing to navigate and and uh, work through now when clients come to us as coaches a lot of them you know we, we actually I will ask them well, what do you want and oftentimes and this is reflective of the way the brain is set up, they know what they don't want because the brain is set up to be on the lookout for threat. And so that need for safety, for certainty um, is very primal in the way that the brain is wired. And what we want to do as coaches is instead of having people focus on what they don't want, which is normal, natural human, right? We actually want to help them refocus attention forward to what they do want and when I demonstrate this when I'm teaching about the brain I do it this way it's like well I don't want to fail I don't want to fail I don't want to fail and as coaches we go okay if that's what you don't want what is it that you do want right so notice when I'm focusing on not failing what am I not focusing on what I want and you can't do both at the same time 
right? You actually really have to help your clients refocus attention from what they don't want without making them feel wrong or bad because that's what the brain's wired to do to keep you safe and just simply switch attention forward, which then gets them into that prefrontal area of the executive brain. And now they're able to focus forward on what they do want. When you start focusing on using this part of the brain, you have so many more resources available to you that allows you to be more innovative, creative, open-minded. Whereas when you're focusing on what you don't want, there's much more fixed thinking going on, right? And then, when we start to get them into this space, we can now start to assist in this and, and support them to build self-awareness, to inquire very gently about what's the inner narrative that's creating your current experience. And is that going to work to get you here? Clearly not, right? You get them to. This is where the self-directed uh, neuroplasticity comes in. And then we step into the four steps with Jeff, which Jeff can walk us through now. Perfect. So, so, so to, to quickly recap that, the, the limbic system, the limbic part of our brain is, is going to, it's where our habits are, it's where our emotions feed into, where our sensory experience feeds into, and it's, our brains are kind of wired to focus on the negative, look out okay. for threats. I got to make a little correction get... there, I, because, because we can't have just a completely not quite true statement of that magnitude just slip right through. So, so um, the habits are from another area. Wait, wait, I think I, hang on. Brian talks about this. Two AIs, um, ancient intelligence, the basal ganglia. Yes, exactly. Yes, the, the, that's the right. basal ganglia. I mean, the basal ganglia is a set of, basal literally means the base of the brain and ganglia are groups of gray matter. And, and so there are several, you know, gray matter cores and, and two, two of them are, are, are called the caudate and the putamen. Together, they're called the striatum. That's because white matter sort of runs through them. And that so in the ancient observations of it, it, it got it's called the striatum. And the striatum is actually, you know, called the habit center. And that that is an area of the brain that we share with animals that have no limbic system at all, because the limbic system is really only in mammals. And, and but 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 the habit center is in birds and in reptiles and in, in many other animals, you know, not just mammals. So limbic mm -hmm. and emotion is really a, a, a mammalian mm -hmm. development, but habit is even more primitive. I mean, so, so, and, and, and so habit is, is um, really, 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 you know, basic brain mechanism and it's completely unconscious. I mean, emotions can be kind of under the surface and that even gets into psychodynamic and whatever, mm -hmm. unconscious feelings, emotions. But, but they're not in principle unconscious. Habits are in principle, basically not, not too conscious. They're automatic. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so we do have these, if you're gonna break it, you know, there's an executive and habit and emotion. And, 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 and that we're trying to integrate, integrate those. And what we're really trying to do is get the habit center to, we like to say, get your, train your, one of the reasons you're doing meditation every day, regular, 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 and developing a habit of doing meditation is because then you develop a habit of consulting your wise advocate. And, and then you get the, the act of like looking to your wise advocate to become automatic. It's a habit. I mean, mm -hmm. And, and, and so we're really trying, we like to say you're sort of wiring your primitive brain to be consulting with the part that's going to advance your executive brain. And, and so that's developing good habits, you know, and, and then, and then the other thing that's also worth saying in that, in that context is, um, preventing a habit from being acted on takes effort, a lot of effort doing the habit doesn't take hardly any effort at all. It's automatic. It's unbelievably efficient. I mean, efficient at the level of like, you know, literally how birds, birds and reptiles work, like really, you know, autumn, but to stop it from happening because you go, wait a second, I, I don't want to be doing that. And to make it conscious, that's the wise advocate. And then to stop, it takes real executive brain energy, literal physical energy. So it's effortful. You, you know, you have, to, you have to make an effort to to stop it. And that gets into what we mentioned, Josie mentioned in passing, the free won't concept, because we don't stress like free will as much as it's not in, it's not as easy to justify on, on a brain basis as, as the free won't. 
because we because the free won't we know that when your brain sends is, sends you messages which do happen before you're even aware they're being sent before you're even aware that you receive them actually but even if you have received them you still don't have to act on them and that's what free won't is that you can get the feeling and not act on it uh, but at the level at, at the level of habit that that takes effort and energy and mindfulness and 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 that's a big that's a and that's called cortical in, inhibitory control which is one of the three basic um parts of executive function the other two being cognitive flexibility and working memory so working mm -hmm. memory you're kind of comparing and contrasting things cognitive flexibility you're seeing things from different perspectives and then inhibitory control is you're preventing the automatic things from just taking over to leave mm -hmm. an open space where you can focus on something else and Perfect. i think it's I important it. it's important to note what jeff just said there when he said preventing, not stopping, right? Because you can't stop the negative, you know, narratives or reactions right. from coming in. So don't even try to stop because if you're trying to stop it, you're giving it more focus and attention, right? Prevent, don't stop. And it's almost like, mm -hmm. and Josie, what, would you have a name for that, that tool? It's almost like you are being the wise advocate for someone else of stopping the habitual, this is what I don't want behavior and shifting it to, okay, what do I do want, which then we can use the, the four steps. But do you have a, a particular phrase or tool you like to think of when, it, when applying that, that, that reframe for people? I've really, it just comes back to refocusing attention because what, you'll, what I've found in my experience in coaching since 2000 is that a lot of people know what they don't want. And it's a wonderful fundamental space to start from and to help them realize, well, it's great that you know what you don't want, but let's actually now do the effortful part of it to think about, well, what is it that you actually do want? They're so used to being on the lookout for the threats, right? So how do you make, that is a really big set for a lot of people that have had this, this constant frame and, and of reference of living in the I don't want space and realizing that, by giving that focus and attention, they're amplifying the very experience that they don't want purely because they're giving it focus and attention. So really our role I see as, as coaches is to help bring awareness to their current experience and by them understanding, oh, so by me focusing attention on what I don't want amplifies the very thing I don't want. Oh my gosh, so I'm creating that experience. So it gives you that sense of personal responsibility and empowerment because all of a sudden you have a choice that you weren't aware of before, right? And just making that shift opens up possibility. And the word that always I'm hearing all the time is hope hope <laughs> then people are just wanting this hope and so when they actually start to think over here they start opening to this idea of mindful awareness and you can start to introduce this concept of the wise advocate perfect well i'm so excited to hear more about the four steps then i know we've danced around it a lot um which one of you are going to take it away Jeff. Well, I guess I've over, you know, I did mention the overview basics and that, and, and that is very important. And then just seeing the integration between um, the four steps and mindfulness and that, and that, you know, the four steps were really designed to bring mindfulness into action for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder, which you, it, in which, you know, the intrusiveness and the power of which these negative bad thoughts are coming in are so strong that that um, we, we, just, we just wanted to try to get to, you know, how can we get the people to realize, wait a second, that's not really me. I mean, that is just my brain sending me a, a false message. And so, and, and that, that's very related to all the mindfulness and assessment and discernment and, and, and dis, you know, making, you know, distinctions between wholesome and unwholesome, skillful and unskillful mental states. So the four steps were, were, were designed around that that aspect of mindfulness. And the first one, relabel, like I mentioned, is, is really just taken from a classic um, mindfulness, you know, insight technique called making mental notes. I mean, and, and it turns out there's now 
uh, you know, quite a bit of science, um, even you know, brain imaging work that that shows that to mention another brain structure, which is really considered largely the core structure of the limbic system, which is the amygdala, which, which um, sits in, deep in, in the temporal lobe and, and, and um, relabeling things, just putting a word on emotional experience quiets the amygdala responses. So that turns out to be quite a powerful way, even of calming the brain down in terms mm -hmm. of you know, the emotions taking over and, and the, you know, and the amygdala can in fact sort of come to control um, acutely how the, how the executive brain focuses. And, and what you want to do is say, wait a second, I want the control to be coming from the executive brain to the amygdala, not from the amygdala to the executive brain. And, mm. and, and um, even that kind of a, of a basic insight and the fact that relabeling is even shown just in terms of um, anatomical activation to quiet the amygdala creates a space. And then when you know that mindfulness enhances executive function, it then the frontal cortex can make choices in the context of all these emotional feelings. And, and um, so, so, and then we bring the, the straight cognitive, um, aspect in in the second step which is reframe which is really saying okay i mean the, you know find the deceptive brain message and and correct it with a true message so see see what's false as false and then the classic cognitive technique of you know correcting it with a true statement um so that so that's why the first two step the first two of the four steps re relabel and reframe really are related to the interface between between mindfulness and and um, cognitive approaches, then refocus. I'm really now in just very recent work, which I'm doing with my close friend uh, Danny Southwick, who is a graduate student um, at Penn Psychology in Angela Duckworth's uh, lab. I mean, he he's actually recently uh, informed me that um, there's a whole aspect of psychology that was I was only vaguely aware of um, called um, uh, creating a, an intentional plan. And, 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 and the four steps, which helped him a lot, um, a lot, the refocus is when you're focusing on doing something. So, you know, an, an action that, that brings intention into play. I mean, so, so first you relabel and you know what you're feeling, you know what you're thinking, you're putting, you know, literally short, short labels on it so that you can even track it, you know, that leads into the cognitive processing of it. So you can say what's deceptive and what's not. I mean, all of that is in, you know, our model done, you know, with the help of in consultation with the wise advocate. And then what I've been saying forever, which really is the breath awareness exercise, when the mind wanders from the feeling of the movement of the air in and out of the nostril, you refocus. I mean, you're training your brain, your mind to pay attention, but that also, that refocusing on something positive is bringing a, you know, an intention, an intention to do a positive action into play. And that turns out to be very helpful. And there's a lot of psychology research on on um, on that kind of mental state where you actually um, focus on something that is an intention to do something to enhance the situation and then you know getting into you know deep sort of stuff that we wrote in theory and, and where we needed some you know quantum mechanical reasoning to make to make a point about about the fact that how you focus your attention actually changes how your brain works. And, and, um, you know, and there is a physical principle called quantum Zeno effect that really underlies the fact that how you focus your attention literally changes the brain to be aligned with what you're focusing your attention on. And so refocusing really is an act that changes your brain 
and that's what I, I wanted that to have a scientific theoretical basis for making the claim that you have self-directed neuroplasticity by how the choices you make about how to focus your attention changes your brain. And, and that's very consistent with William James and, you know, in his masterpiece, The Principles of Psychology. And we, he said, volitional action, willful action is effort of attention. So all the will really is, is the effort that you make to focus your attention. And then we now can say that there's a good scientific basis to say that changes your brain. And, and, you know, and, and, and there's now a significant amount of brain imaging research to substantiate that. Oh, so, you know, that, that, so refocusing really serves a lot of functions there. And, and, um, and then as you do that, your brain changes. So the revalue part really happens as, as the process of making adaptive refocusing. So you relabel, you frame, reframe, re, you refocus, repetitively relabel, reframe, refocus, consult with your wise advocate and your brain changes. And as your brain changes, your values evolve and then you're pursuing your true self. Because, because then the self-directed neuroplasticity is happening in conjunction with consultation with the wise advocate. And that's what we mean about, you know, you're, 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 you're in the process of pursuing your true self. And, that, and that's where revalue comes in because your values are enhanced and evolving. And then a, a, another really simple way to think about the whole thing about true self what, you know, what do we do is, you know, like literally, like, how would I want people to remember me? How, you know, how would I want, you know, my children, my closest relatives, my closest friends to remember what I was trying to do with my life? That, that, that's a, you know, that's a very practical way of thinking about, well, what is my true self? I love that. We actually, the, one of the very first things that we do in the program is the eulogy exercise. So thinking you have just passed, what do people, how do you want I never them heard of that, but so. eulogy exercise is what I just said. Yeah. I love that. And, and, and okay. So relabeling and that helps us shift from the emotional response into a cognitive function of I'm aware of this. We're, we're, yes. put, we're putting a label that, on the word. That is right. I'm aware. And of then that. reframing. Um, so being conscious of what's going on, moving from a deceptive. True or false. Exactly. Reframing. True or is false. It true perfect. or is it false? Refocusing. Like making an assessment, uh, you know, and a, discern, a discernment and then focusing your attention on the true, not the false. I love that, that phrase from William James, that effortful. Yeah, volitional effort is effort of attention effort of attention, focusing our attention and repeating that over and over. And as we exactly. do that, then it. we revalue as our brain starts to reshape it's itself right. in alignment because, with because our wise advocate. Focusing of attention changes the brain. And we've said for a long time, since before 2006, because actually 2004 is when we started doing the work that led to us presenting it in, in Asolo, Italy in 2006 at the meeting that Josie was at. And even then we had already said, the, the power is in the focus. I mean, that's what we, that's what we, you know, that's what we meant by that. The power uh, of focus. That's so good. So then Josie, how do you, so we're all aligned on the four steps and, and we know we'll send people to the book and I'm sure you use the book, all the resources that you have, but if you're working with, with an individual, how do you get them to remember these enough to be able to apply them in a situation with, uh, someone on their team or a broader strategic decision, knowing that it's obviously a, a much, much broader topic, but is there like a, um, like an acronym or some way that, that, that people can remember to apply this when you have, have clients? The, the, you know, Jeff and I refer to them as the four R's, you know, the, the relabel. Now with the relabel, the first thing I want to say about that though, is that um, there's a distinction between naming the emotion versus explaining it. So labeling is not the same as rumination. And it's very, very important to be clear about that. You want your clients or be your own ability to name the emotion that they're feeling, but don't go into an explanation about why you feel that way. Because when you go into the amplification about why you feel that way, what are you doing? 
right? You're actually feeding it, you're growing it. So all you need to do is, yeah, what, I feel, what am I feeling right now? And the way to do that is to tune in. And that is not so easy for people who run here and are constantly in motion. They're not actually taking the time to pause, which doesn't take that long actually to be able to raise their conscious awareness to be able to very accurately label the emotion because people that are out of practice with that find that extremely difficult to do. And maybe, Jeff, it might be helpful to actually do a two-minute breath awareness meditation yeah, right now. I mean, we have, I mean... And I, to know, show I, people how simple and how quick um, the practice actually can be. I, and, and I, I do this. Yep, yeah, and I, that I, have. I do this in my coaching sessions with people, especially when they're in that heightened state. I just say, look, let's just take a minute to fully arrive. Let's, let's just breathe together and I'll actually walk them through this practice. And they don't feel so uncomfortable when they're in a private space you know, with someone that they trust and they just let themselves soften and release some of this, you know, emotional hijacking that can assist, that can really interfere with our capacity for calm and clarity. So I'll, I'll invite you, Jeff, if that's appropriate, Michael, to maybe do a two-minute breath awareness meditation with us. Okay, good. Yeah, and it is. It gives you, and it'll show you just sort of how basic, you know, there's basic but, you know, very very grounded in you know in a very ancient established way of doing this um and um okay so the thing is if you're going to be mindful it's you know there's an object of mindfulness and and in and, and in the breath awareness exercise which i like to call an exercise as opposed even to a meditation because it really you know makes it more like literally you're building your brain it makes it just more it we're trying to take all of the I don't know, sort of unnecessary kind of baggage and just make it like, you know, this is goal oriented for practical people, right? I mean, and, and, and the object in a breath awareness exercise is a very specific thing. It's a feeling, a physical feeling, a, a physical feeling. And that physical feeling is caused by the movement of air as you breathe in, you know, and, uh, you know, generally at the nostril is, is, is by far the most traditional, um, well-established place to, 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 to be aware of it. So it's a feeling of the movement of the air as it, as it goes in and out. I guess I'll just throw in rising and falling of the abdomen is, is, is another useful um, place, but it's not as traditional. And, and, and um, okay, the reason why um, I added a specific kind of account, uh, making counting, because counting for, for entry level uh, work and breath awareness is very traditional too. But it, it's also well understood. And in our practice too, it's well understood that the counting is just to get oriented, to get going. And you know, as you know, days leads into weeks, leads into months, um, the counting becomes less and less you know, a central part of it. It, it, it tends to fall away. But that doesn't mean you can't always go back to it. But the, re the reason why for like a two minute exercise, it's very useful or a five and we say, and the other thing I want to stress is when you do this, set a timer, because when, especially when you're doing focused attention meditation or, or focused attention, breath awareness exercise, um, you know, setting a timer immediately deals with the intrusive question, how much longer am I having to do this? I mean, and, 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 and when you're trying to focus attention, that is a distraction. And, and so, you, you know, you're just doing this until the timer goes off. And, and five minutes is a perfectly reasonable time. I mean, I guess you go a little longer, okay. But I mean, I, mean I, I just want people to do it because the habit part is the most important, especially when you're getting started. A few minutes, three minutes every day is better than one hour every week. I mean, um, in terms of, right, I mean, it's really a regular practice is really important. Um, okay, so the breath, you want to slow it down and, and we use the count to just get it at, at, at a pace where, where it's easier to observe, it's easier to feel the feeling and, and, and plus it's a pace that actually has a, 
a calming effect in, intrinsically. And actually, if you just did it, this kind of a pace arises naturally, actually. Um, so we're just trying to enhance that process a little bit by using this count. And the count is, could not be more simple. On the in-breath, you go one, two, three, one. And then on the out-breath, you go one, two, three, two. And then on the next in-breath, you go one, two, three, three. And then on the out breath, one, two, three, four, and you start over. So it's a two breath, you know, one, so one, two, three. So what you're doing during this counting is counting the feeling of the moving air. So the first thing we do is go breathe in through the, so you sit straight, you know, not, not rigid, but straight. And, you know, and, and, and you sit kind of straight, but not rigid or stiff, but, and, and then you breathe in. I'm just accentuating that so it makes a, a bit more of a sound. But, because, but what you're trying to pay attention to is a feeling, the feeling of the, that moving air. It causes a feeling somewhere around the nostril area. And you can feel it. It's a physical sensation. And then when you breathe out, you feel a slightly different sensation in a similar place. Okay. So now you breathe in, you breathe out. And now I'll add the count. In, two, three, one, one, two, three, two. In, two, three, three. Out, two, three, four. In, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, one, two, three, four. And now let's just go for a minute. Well, I set a timer for one okay. minute good. following no, that was rule good. number one. <laughs> Which was good. It was. That was very good. So great. And you can see. And so one of the things I want to stress, and I mentioned it in passing, even in that one minute, you know, slightly more than a minute it was, it was probably closer to a minute and a half. I was just looking at a, a, a minutes without a, a, a second hand. So like, Michael's got his eyes closed here. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, but, but um, <laughs> I knew it wouldn't be more than two minutes anyway. So, 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 um, um, you know, even in that time, you're going to see, you're going to get intrusive thoughts. You're going to, you know, and you're probably going to lose attention to that feeling even in one minute. I mean, and then, so what is the real point? It, the point is not in and of itself to keep the mind fixed on that feeling. The point is being able to be aware of when the mind wanders and gently bringing it back to the feeling. And, and, and basically what will happen is you'll kind of lose track of it without fully losing track of it and bring it back without, you know, and, and, and so, you, you know, a lot of the practice is becoming, you'll see it's an enhancement of your awareness of that feeling and becoming more quickly aware of when you're, you've lost track of it. And all of that we like to frame it as saying that's your wise advocate 
helping you be aware of where your attention is, which is a primary aspect of mindfulness to be sure. But the reason we like the wise advocate is because it brings in this inner loving guide, helper, comforter, advocate, encourager, strengthener aspect. So, so, and, 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 and just doing that and now, you know, just science, like science. I mean, even the most skeptical people aren't going to be too denying or skeptical now that, that, that doing that exercise regularly for even a couple of weeks will enhance connectivity between executive and emotional brain and, 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 and enhance general executive brain function. I love it. Thank you so much for that. And and just it's always astonishes me one minute just just can c- completely reset an emotional tone and reset a focus. Right. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you for all the wisdom. Love to bring up some people for coaching. We'll go to Kelly first. In the meantime, where can people go to find more about your work, um, books, resources, etc? Okay, that's Jody's department. I mean, the, you know, where do you, what do you do now is, is her department. We'll, we'll send all the links to you, Michael, but we've got the Wise Advocate uh, website, which is wiseadvocate, A-D-V-O-C number eight.com. We've also got jo- jeffreymschwartz.com. And we've also got josiethompson.com. And if you want to look at the You Are Not Your Brain uh, online course, that's on my website, uh, the modules for the Wise Advocate are available sh- soon. They're coming and they'll be on the Wise Advocate website. And Jeff has uh, the breath awareness exercise and a whole host of amazing videos that you can also go and watch for free on his website. So we'll send you all the links for those. I think it might have dropped out just momentarily, at least it did for me. So Wise Advocate is has the number eight in it for the A-T-E. It's W I S. A D V O C the number eight dot com, mm-hmm. but then but you know, and then the book you are not your brain is is kind of I think the you know the the basic source for for this information. The four steps, and then the application for leadership obviously is the wise advocate. Mm. Hold that up again. What an amazing! <laughs> I love the 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 compass there yeah. pointing to wisdom. So good. Um, so check that out. It's amazing. I love it. Um, and the yeah. resource. And again, the, the wise advocate, wise advocate, like with the, with the right. number eight, although mm-hmm. Google will send you to that if oh. you just type it in. Okay. Kelly, I see that you are with us and also driving. So let me check in. <laughs> um, we can go elsewhere or, you, or what's the, what's this? Are we pull over a bowl? Like what's the. <laughs> We're good. Okay. Take it away. Oh, oh, okay. So I think my question is more for Josie. So I'm driving at like 25 miles an hour on a straightaway for the next 10 minutes. So it's, this is, this is safe. Um, so quick background. I've, for 23 years, my husband and I raised our three sons, including premature twins who were born too soon and died too soon, but lived a hundred years in their 22 and 23 years of life. Um, And Eric especially had OCD anxiety with traits of autism with the perseverative behavior, but his respiratory distress was also sky high. So physiologically, he was always in crisis as well as then emotionally. Um, And so I've got that history my other kid was non-mobile, non-verbal, but very laid back. He just thought he'd rather laugh at you than with you. Um, and he had a Stephen Hawking body with a Drew Carey sense of humor. But my husband, and Josie, I think this is more for you. I don't know your brain tumor, and, and I don't want to be asking questions if you don't care to share. Um, but my, Bruce has glioblastoma, and so he had a two-inch uh, racquetball-sized tumor removed from his right temporal lobe. It was... 100% resection other than with glio, you never get 100%. And um, he's got things lighting up in his right amygdala, uncus, and um, high hippocampus. So I'm trying to figure out, 
he decided that he's living. He's decided that he's clean of cancer because that's how he's choosing and we are choosing to live. You know, it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with it. Um, but there's this level of anxiety where I feel like uh, they don't know if the tumor is percolating, and uh, he wears an Optune device, which is 27 electrodes with alternating electrical fields that inhibit cell reproduction. And so we think that's really working for him. Um, whatever it is, it's been nearly a year, and it hasn't progressed, which with GBM is a miracle. He, he's, our, he's, our, uh, he's our medical unicorn. Uh, we, we frequently pull up pictures of Fluffy from Despicable Me because he's he's a medical unicorn. Um, but there's holes and there's anxiety and there's bizarre behavior. I mean, he's still working full time as a CFO. He just finished a 10K. He's doing it. He's a miracle. But, but there's this anxiety and He's got his own wise advocate, but I don't know how to, A, call my own wise advocate because then my amygdala kicks in. Um, I mean, don't tell me people don't die. I've buried two kids, right? So how do I do my wise advocate? But then also with this kind of Swiss cheese brain that he's living with, how do I support his wise advocate? And as I'm saying that, the answer is breath control. But I'm betting that there's more than that. All right. Well, I'm I'm really just want to acknowledge your journey and how oh, thank you. You know, incredibly courageous you are um, for what you've lived through. Um, I'm not going to talk about it from the medical or science perspective at all. Jeff, you could add to okay. that. I'm, I'm going to talk to it from the personal experience side of it. Thank uh, you. Regardless, regardless of the detail, um, there is a concept called priming. When oh. you fix your mind on something, you know, when, when the doctors handed me that piece of paper that said six months to live, uh, my husband at the time, I'd only been married two years uh, fell apart and he believed what this expert just told us and that night when he left the hospital he never came back oh so God. he went into flight flight and he ran because he could but here I was in the hospital bed reading these words and there was something in my brain that said because I was working as an accountant at the time I was very analytical and when we're in threat we want certainty, you know, we, we want facts, yes. we want something to calm us down and to mitigate that stress and anxiety. And so I wanted proof that what he was saying was actually true because something in me we had just been disturbed and I wasn't sure what to believe. You know, there was part of me that went, can I swear? <laughs> shit, 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 shit. And then there was another part of me that actually spoke up and said, how do you know that for sure? Yeah. And I was not satisfied with the answer that I got. And I chose, just as your husband is doing, to take the gap in the game. I chose in that moment that I wanted to live. Now, there's a huge distinction between saying I don't want to die versus I want to live. And this is what yeah. I was saying before, that clients will often know what they don't want. Yeah. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. That's great. And it means you want to live, but you're not focusing on living. And so what I did in that moment is I decided okay. I wanted to live. And so all I had to focus on doing was aligning my thoughts, my words, and my deeds with that intention. And so will you have moments of anxiety and stress? Of course you will. But just like any thought, it comes and it goes. And whatever you focus your attention on is what will get amplified. You know, I've heard Brian say this before, where focus goes, energy flows. So when that little distortion comes in that freaks you out because of uncertainty, how much of life is really in your control anyway? We can't control what goes on out there, but we get to decide how we respond. 
So it's okay to have a moment of freak out. It's okay to feel scared. It's okay to have a moment of anxiety, but set your path, set your focus. I want this. Can, what can I do to take charge of that experience right now? It's not going to mean I'm going to live forever. You know, it's, that's not actually true. But right. I can live this moment fully in the experience that I want to have. You have just given me A, peace, but B, insight. Um, speaking of swearing, I do in fact sound like a sailor. Um, but part of my disconnect is he's so functional and I'm a caregiver. And I think this, and will somebody please email this to me or write it down for me? Where focus goes, energy flows. Because he is, he, he, I might, to some extent, I'm excluded. He's focusing on what he needs to do. And I don't know how to, I mean, I accommodate as much as I can, but then some of the things are, there may be a few gender things. There may be a few 35 years of marriage things. And on occasion, just because you have cancer doesn't mean you're not a jerk. So there's some of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Another thing, Kelly, for you as a carer, I would say that your goal is to be the best support that you can be for him. One of the deceptive brain messages that Jeff talks about in the book, You Are Not Your Brain, is, is mind. What is it, Jeff? It's crystal balling. Um, yeah, you're right. I'm what's the good. word for that? Um, I, 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 I can't, I've, I've lost the words at the moment. Right. But thinking that you know what the other person's thinking or thinking that you know what the other yes. person let go fortune, of the driving fortune telling, error. Oh, fortune telling that's just, the one and somebody said he's actually but i like fortune telling. yes so kelly's to say to him you know just let go of it needing to have the answer and say honey how can i support you right now what do you need well that's when i don't want to kill him which is also you know if the cancer doesn't get you i will yeah. Um, <laughs> and I want to acknowledge what you went through in that hospital bed at the young age of 24. I just can't even. Um, and so I appreciate and honor your journey and strength and grace and wisdom, and then to take it forward for the rest of us to learn from. So thank absolutely, you. You're I'm a welcome. disability advocate, and I want to give both of you kudos I always you know I use the word advocate all the time because I do advocacy but you forget what that word means somebody in the chat goes advocate means that that's the voice that's talking with your best interest in heart that the advocate is for you meaning the me whoever the me is, is and right. I think that's, that's right. great yeah. Um, but thank you to both of you and then Jeffrey I, uh, Dr. Schwartz I totally appreciated your um, talk on I fell a little bit in love with you. I'm a fangirl after your Larry King talk with Brian and James. Okay. All right. And um, thank you, Josie. Now I'm a fangirl of you too. Okay. And, and thank, thank you, you, Kelly. Uh, I'm so glad that, that, this, that uh, you were in a safe driving space. Um, and I, I just love getting to connect with you every time you come up. And just always, I'm just so inspired. Oh, and Josie, well, I'm driving there. to babysit for my grandsons, the two and three year old. So, <laughs> oh, amazing! Well, have have fun advocating for their best interests, um, and enjoy the the young ones. That line, Josie, around, um, I don't want to die is there's a huge thing I don't want to die, and I want to live. Um, and just the the depth there of that that demonstration of focusing on what we don't want versus what we do want and and to really get the the difference um and and that will stick with me for a, a long 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 time and then having made that distinction aligning our thoughts our words our actions with that thing that we do want and moving forward towards that so huge um, i get so really i get really disheartened well i do a lot of work with hank cancer and leukemia patients and i hear people say i want to live i want to live but then they'll go and drink alcohol and eat sugar and do all these things that just you know completely destroy that you know intention and i think what i say to people is that desire and commitment are two very different things 
we often have desire, you know, I should lose weight, I should stop this, I should, 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 should. And Jeff, I love it when he says, stop shooting all over yourself, just decide, you know. And it's once you get, once you really make that decision and you realise it's a, it's a conscious choice, you draw the line in the sand and say, right, I want this outcome and I will do and commit myself fully to align mentally, emotionally, physically with that intention, then you hold yourself accountable. You know, you'll have moments where you'll get scared, where, you know, there'll be some uncertainty, but you keep your focus, you stay intentional on that outcome. And as much as you can influence that outcome, you take full responsibility for showing up in alignment that, with that intention. In, intention might be the word, if we had a chart of all the words that were shared today, intention might be the one that was, that came out the most. And, and I love the, ending it there too around, um, we, we can't control the outcome, right? But we can control how we show up and to, to set that intention and to align our thoughts, words, actions, et cetera, with that intention, um, letting go of things we can't control continuing to practice over and over and over and over, never actually finding this true self, being this true self, but practicing that more and more consistently, that, that will resonate align with every person on this call. And it is, it is the uh, eternal and universal work and wisdom that is passed down through the ages in so many different traditions and words, et cetera. And I just so appreciate and love the way that you, uh, both of you have taken that wisdom and packaged it in an accessible way with the wise advocate. I'm um, showing us how we can apply it in various different contexts and from the very, very personal to the very, very professional and everything in between constantly and never ending going on that journey. So thank you so, so, so much before you go and you can do this together or separately. Frankly, I think separately would be more fun. Um, What's something that we can do for you? So I'd love to offer the support, the intention of our community um, to move forward something that you are excited to see, um, get more energy, get more attention, just move forward in the world. It can be down to a way that we are treating ourselves or those close to us to more of a, a formal kind of aggressive or go check out this project or invest some time here. What's one thing that we can do as a community for you? You know, Joe, I mean, Joe, the, we, we have worked on some things together, and I think that's the answer that we want to give. So let, I'll let Josie tell you about some of these things we've worked on together. This is a tough question because for me, you know, what I want is for people to be well and live full, um, healthy, happy lives. And I would like to think that our work really does contribute to people's capacity to do that. So connecting with your inner loving guide on a daily basis to inform more conscious choices about how you create a better world is really what we want. Um, oh, I think, Jeff. Yeah, no, I'm sure. <laughs> and I mean, so the more people that, that really do come across the wise advocate and um, so maybe, you know, supporting us that way, uh, talking about it, sharing it, uh, directing people to the wiseadvocate.com website. And when the modules are available, hopefully in the new year, come and join us for the journey. Amazing. Jeff, you, you sound like you want to add something there. Is there, excuse me, Dr. Oh, Schwartz. I mean, yeah, if, if, um, honestly, um, I, th I would say that I, th I think in what I've said, I've contextualized enough how the wise advocate is connected to, um, you know, larger, larger conceptions. I mean, I'd, I'd like to, you know, hope that people can can get connected to some some of those larger perspectives. But but um, I think that just saying remember that the wise advocate is 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 um, not just not just something your brain makes. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the questions that I really, you know, kind of say this person's not really going to get it is when they go and where in where is this wise advocate in my brain? I mean, and and um, see, so 
So that brings in sort of an aspect of this, and that really makes me very neuroscience, you know, non-friendly. I mean, pe pe neuroscience people do not like when I say that at all, and they, they are willing to try to stop me from saying it or trying to stop when I say it from becoming public, at least in, neuro in, in academic neuroscience circles. I mean, well, reviewers, reviewers will do that. So I love it. So it's a, long, it's a big concept. And I mean, hopefully it'll be an entry point for some of the bigger applications of it in, would be great. And pursuing those, those bigger applications and that, that, that higher, truly the higher, higher ground. Um, I love that. And um, we'll commit to that. And it, <laughs> one of the questions for me that created a kind of insight was where am I? So I love that the, that the neuroscientists are like, no, avoid that question. And from a philosophical, when you start asking that, it's like, oh, wow, it's, it's, I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, by the way, the yellow book behind you, is that how Adam Smith can change your life? No, the yellow book? This, you mean, which one? Yeah, that one. Yeah, no, this is actually by a friend of ours. Um, uh, Rebecca uh, Newton is her name, and it's called Authentic Gravitas. And I'm actually going to be giving some lectures with her for the London School of Economics uh, the week after next. Amazing. So she, Have you heard of how Adam Smith can change your life? Um, there were books about Adam Smith. I mean, I, I, I yeah. Guess, so I mean, it, it it takes this the you know wealth of nations most known for that, but the moral treaties. It's like, hey, Adam Smith's got a second book. Yeah, that's no, amazing. I, I heard about that. Yeah. that. I mean, sure, there are you know there are good, good. Yep. Perfect. Well, um, thanks again, both of you, so so much. This has been amazing. Um, so appreciate your wisdom. And on behalf of connecting with our mindful advocates, our wise advocates, more and more consistently sharing your work, raising the consciousness and connecting to the thing that our wise advocates may be a proxy for or a conduit to, absolutely 100%. Let's do that and uh, have a fantastic rest of your day, rest of your week, rest of your Tuesday for you, Josie. Um, and uh, I'm sure this is just the beginning. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.